Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another uh, live streaming session of SACPA. Um, SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And we pay our respects to their past, present, future, and cultural her heritage beliefs and relationship to the land. Today, we have with us uh, Dr. Dan Johnson. Um, on the topic of why we need insects and spiders, which of them are declining and which moving in. Um, before we introduce Dan, I would also like to very much acknowledge a very special thank you to the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight and the Lethbridge Herald. So today we have Dan Johnson. Uh, Dan promotes public understanding of science, especially our ecosystems, and biodiversity. He conducts research on weather and life, sustainable crop protection, entomology, and environment. As a professor at the University of Lethbridge, he has taught environmental science, data analysis, experimental design, biogeography, and insect ecology. He is the vice president of Entomological Society of Alberta. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dan, and I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Annalise. Thank you for all the help. And if I'm live now, I also want to thank uh, Bev Mundell Atherstone and SACPA for suggesting this topic. So, um, Let's start with the uh, first slide. I'm assuming that you can you can see it there, right? Right. So if you, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, uh, I, there's something on on my mind lately. Um, how would you like to go to Mars and search for life and find some tiny remnant of past life on Mars? Wouldn't that be exciting? Uh, but on the next slide, I'd like to note uh, um, you can uh, do it right here. Uh, you already can do that. You can uh, you can look at the ancient life of Earth and look at the amazing, incredible biodiversity that's resulted from it, particularly in today's topic in the arthropod world. So on the next slide, there's a couple of examples I'll just show you of some of the wild and crazy things that you can find right outside in, in uh, uh, the door, basically. So what I'm going to do is, this is such a huge topic, declines, invasions, and so on, is just give you a glimpse of some of the details of the lives of insects and spiders and maybe foster a little more appreciation. Uh, I'm sure that everybody has a little appreciation for them already, but maybe a little more. And then along the way, talk about declines and invasions and some examples. Uh, and you can often find very unexpected things. Um, for example, um, this, uh, I have to, okay, good. Uh, or Oregon swallowtail, I saw one day and I hadn't seen one in my 30 years of tramping around the grasslands. So it, it does, it does happen. So we're all in the same boat. Now on the next slide, I just mentioned five things about insect declines. Uh, my answer when asked about this for the last few years has been, before we can talk about declines, we have to talk about a bigger problem, and that is that we don't have a lot of data. So in many cases, we know that certain insects are not declining, others possibly are, but the biggest problem is we don't really have the kind of monitoring that we would need to even be able to tell. Everybody's heard about the uh, uh, windshield surveys and so on, uh, but if you happen to drive past a wetland, all of a sudden you get a lot of insects, so that that is not really a good database, although uh, there are indications. And the one that, uh, my five points here, data, better records, better time series, and working together, the most important one is number five, citizen science. If we can bring people into this as basically amateur scientists, amateur entomologists who are aware of the world around them and keep track of species, uh, we can have uh, an enormously better database for answering these questions. Okay, the first example I'll talk about on the next slide here is the monarch butterfly. Uh, I think people have seen the uh, seen pictures of them in the press and so on, but you might not have seen the caterpillar, this black and white and yellow striped caterpillar on 
on showy milkweed, which is a food plant. There's a close up of its head. Sorry, I'm trying to get back into the chat here so that I can give proper signals. There we go. OK, so uh, this is uh, the caterpillar. And. Uh, great. And uh, um, the chrysalis is the next one, the green. Uh, green, nice green package there that has the monarch butterfly developing in it. I found exactly two this year. Usually I find zero because we are at the northern edge of the range, but it's an interesting story in North America. The monarch butterfly. As, as people know, migrates and it, they, they, uh, they overwinter together. When they get this far north, they have a lot of challenges, like a short season. But on the next one, you can see one of the biggest challenges is that the food plant grows on the roadsides and it's covered in dust. And in this case, the one chrysalis that looked like it was going to produce a butterfly was in serious trouble. So in the next slide, you can see what we did. Uh, my son, has packaged up that chrysalis, taken it out to a, a nearby lake with pristine environmental conditions, and then let it emerge and fly away. And there's the adult monarch and the, the beautiful uh, uh, monarch butterfly against the sky and the grass. You can see the two black dots on the back wing. That indicates it's a male. If there were black stripes across, it would be a viceroy, which looks just like it because it's a classic case of uh, uh, pretending evolutionarily, pretending to look like a toxic species. That's what the viceroy does because the monarch has toxins that it's sequestered from the milkweed plant. Let's look at a little bit of long term data on the monarch just really quickly. Uh, when agriculture, uh, the way we practice it with tillage, came to North America, it probably boosted the monarch butterfly, their numbers, because of the weed being uh, at, at a better <clears throat> in a better situation for growing. But lately, since the 90s, there have been ups and downs, but mostly downs, and it looks like they're down by some say half, some say two thirds. Uh, we're not exactly sure why, but on the next slide, you can see there's many articles out there that you could find talk about habitat loss, pesticides, wildfire, changes in the food plant. Um, if uh, climate does continue to warm, there'll be differences in the availability of the food plant and so on. So that's a problem. Uh, uh, there are societies that uh, track it, follow it, and it's fallen to a record low. And in fact, on this next slide, it mentions other butterflies and they're declining. We don't know what will happen to them. Maybe they're fine, but it could be in our lifetime that some of these are just lost. So what can we do? Well, on the next slide, you can see a picture of what it looks like in the wintertime. If you find a milkweed uh, that's blown all of its seeds away, I grabbed some before fall and winter came, and so I'm planting it and spreading it around. Um, if we actually planted it down in the river valley, in the parks, the golf courses, and so on, and there is a program in the USA to do that on golf courses, we could do it here. That would actually likely help because when they get to the northern extent of the range, if they can find a food plant, they have a chance. If they don't find a food plant, that's the end of the road. Uh, so like the Chicago Tribune says here, uh, it's not too early to plan your monarch garden. So uh, try to find some milkweed seed. And by the way, when you're out there looking at milkweeds, there are tiny green and blue beetles. There are big red beetles. I hope no one confuses them with the horrible red lily beetle that is invading. Uh, but this one, uh, tetraopes, uh, means four eyes, and you can see why. It's got a, a pair of eyes above the antenna and a pair of eyes below the antenna. Okay, let's look at an actual scientific paper here. This is not uh, really necessarily a primary scientific paper with a lot of new data, but it's a very good summary of what could be done, uh, steps that we could take as individuals, as citizen scientists to help uh, guard against the global declines or local declines. Not all insects are declining, but we need to find out which are. That's part of the problem. We don't know. On the next slide, they mention eight things. Converting lawns, growing native plants, reducing pesticide use, uh, rational applications, uh, exterior lighting is an issue. Uh, soap and salt runoff, oil runoff and highways and so on. Uh, counter negative perceptions of insects, and I would say and spiders. 
but that's another question, I suppose, is more guttural feeling about spiders. But number seven is the important one, I think. Become an educator yourself. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to even have a course. If you read and study and keep your eyes open, you can become a very useful citizen scientist in entomology and ecology. Uh, now let's talk about how they live here. On the next slide, I show something really weird that's going on next month, or, and the month after actually. Uh, brood ten of the uh, of the uh, seventeen year cicadas coming out. Uh, in two thousand and four, I, I, it sounds obsessive, but I uh, timed a visit to Toronto so that I could, at the end of it, uh, rent a car drive down to Cincinnati and see them in their millions. And they were actually emerging in churchyards and places that hadn't been disturbed in that length of time uh, in such numbers that they were bowing the branches of the trees down. Uh, on the next slide, it shows what an adult looks like after it comes out. And we actually have our own. On the next slide, you'll see one of the several common cicadas we have. This one is very weird. It's a northern grassland uh, species called the walking cicada. It, it lives on grass, not on trees. It's very strange. And it has a strange life cycle that spreads over several years. I've been following it for decades. Uh, now, what about our special northern problems? Well, invaders can only invade if they, can, if they are adapted to our cold conditions and our special short seasons and so on. Uh, but what about the decliners? Well, they might be on the edge already so that changes in weather, changes in management might set them off. Here's a nice example. If you saw a pile of sand like this, you might notice uh, these are eggs, pods of eggs, hundreds and hundreds of eggs that have appeared because a population has increased. Sometimes they can be knocked back by weather. Uh, here's an article in which uh, Alex Wild, a uh, famous insect uh, photographer and entomologist, talks about the cold in Texas. Now, the human tragedy of the cold in Texas, of course, is the big story. That is the thing that we're most concerned about. But in addition, uh, it affected biodiversity, and many things just couldn't handle it, and it is changing the numbers. On the next slide, you can see a close-up of some eggs in the soil. I've chosen this grasshopper as my symbol for what happens with insects in, in Alberta and places like Alberta. They have to overwinter in this egg stage. Others overwinter as inactive. In both cases, they have special alcohols in their blood, like glycerol, that actually act as antifreeze agent. On the next slide, you can see I've cleared the, uh, the cori on the outside of the egg so that you could see the little a baby grasshopper basically growing inside. On the next slide, I've removed the outside of the egg. So you can see a grasshopper that's one hour from hatching and you can see the perfect packing of the little legs and so on. That actually has antifreeze agent in it. So if it goes down to minus 10, it still survives. Quite amazing. It wiggles out. Here's one wiggling out of an egg uh, shell, shakes itself off, dries, stretches out, and then darkens. And then the next thing it has to do is eat for a week or two and shed the skin. Being an insect or being a spider is not easy. Ecdysis, removing the skin, is a really, really difficult and risky situation. On the next one, this white bit of skin left, you can see that it's not only shed the skin from its eyes, its antennae, its feet, everything, legs, but even those long threads are the breathing tubes that were inside the insect. That it, Here you can see inside the head, uh, it had to rip those out and, and eventually it comes out there it is. Now, this is a northern species that's exploding in huge numbers, and we don't know why. Uh, this is a this graph shows a long-term database of grasshoppers because it happens to be something that's been counted for agricultural reasons. You notice at the end, in the last 10 or 20 years, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. We don't know really if that's climate or uh, uh, unusual life cycle or a combination of both. On the next graph, which is the only graph of my own data that I'll show here, you can see that in one county, Cardston, and another county, Lethbridge, you have this slow cycle up and slow cycle down, slow cycle up, slow cycle down. So the lag uh, effect on the bottom there looks kind of like a, uh, oh, some sort of a, a spinning uh, weather vane or something going back and forth. It's over on the right for a few years and then over on the left. And all that means is that 
It tends to track over several years. But in the next graph, you can see how odd it is in the north. Up, down, up, down, up, down. It's an absolute on and off switch situation. So we don't know what exactly is going on. I've collected uh, eggs up there and they do indeed hatch two years later. So there's something crazy going on. So we, there's some of these things we don't want to increase, others we do. Now, here's a bird, this is a burrowing owl. Obviously it has a special interest in, in this insect. It's another of the reasons why we care about insects. On the next slide, you can see, uh, it looks like a parts uh, store for beetles. These are some that I removed from one of the pellets that the burrowing owl coughs up. And I've tried to assemble them back together into shapes. Uh, you can find uh, tibia, trochanter, all the different parts of the legs of the insects. And then also, by the way, in the next one, a bunch of grasshopper parts. So uh, this is the kind of thing that, you know, if you sterilize it with a little alcohol or maybe an oven, um, uh, a young entomologist could uh, piece together with better eyes than I have. Now, this next slide shows a grasshopper, and I'm not going to talk about grasshoppers very much, but uh, this one shows a grasshopper that birds depend on uh, very much in the spring. This one overwinters in an active form. It actually has antifreeze agent in the body to the level that it can go down to minus five, minus eight, and then come back to life when it warms up, go down again and come back to life when it warms up, make it through the winter. It's quite an amazing thing. Here's one walking on the snow. I photographed uh, in January. Uh, so quite amazing that a cold blooded animal can do that at all, but it's there for the birds in the spring. This is an entirely different one covered with bumps and tubercles. This one's called uh, uh, red legged uh, grasshopper. And in the summer and fall, here's a scientific paper by Cy Mayhoff. He's found that this one tiny grasshopper, which is of no significant consequence at all, it's not controlled, it's not cared for, it's not conserved, is the main food source for uh, sharp-tailed grouse. Um, ben Ellard and Caitlin Lutz at the research center has helped uh, Sai do uh, stable isotopic analysis of the, of the bird feathers and the insects and so on. So we've put together a food web, but they're not all friendly. Uh, well, they're friendly perhaps, but they're not all good for us. This one is, of course, uh, uh, the bane of, um, of uh, farmers and gardeners. It's a two-striped grasshopper. Uh, and so we have to uh, distinguish between the good and the bad. It's just the way it is. It takes a little bit of detailed work and it can be done. Uh, I'm trying to make a network uh, of interested individuals that would like to do grasshopper watching and report on them. And we could do the same with beetles and spiders for that matter. Other experts could be involved. Okay, here's an example of another obvious uh, concern we have for insects. Uh, this is Hunt's bumblebee. Uh, at least I think it is. I'm not a bumblebee expert, but I watch them all the time. Uh, and this is the golden, the great golden digger wasp. Uh, if you, it looks rather frightful, but it's not uh, going to sting you. It's really just a pollinator, very important pollinator. This is a longhorned bee. You might have seen these. I'm just, uh, these are some of the tidbits I'm throwing out to get people interested, uh, especially the younger ones between the ages of five and 100. Uh, these are longhorned bees, and these are the males, and the males are really not allowed in the little hives, so they're kicked out and they sleep uh, in the sunflowers. You can see them in your garden. Now, back to a little bit of science here, I guess. So we've known for a couple of years, three years maybe now, that insects really are uh, declining in some places. There's a good study in Germany, a very long, long uh, study by um, amateurs, very intelligent and educated amateurs, but nonetheless amateurs. Um, other places, Puerto Rico, many places, they have been in decline. A few here, but we've tried to identify them. I mean, we have species at risk in Canada. Um, there's a skipperling, of course, in Manitoba that's very famous, uh, the rusty patch bumblebee, some butterflies, the carna, carna blue uh, butterfly, and Taylor's checker spot, and so on. But, but uh, even beyond just species at risk, we might see important insects declining because of some of the challenges they face. And one that was mentioned a minute ago, I'll throw it out here, that you wouldn't have expected, perhaps, is light pollution in cities. Uh, is changing um, the way they, 
they uh, can survive and reproduce and, and, and migrate. Okay, let's let's just look at a couple more places where insects help us and why we should care, right? Here's an obvious one, pest control. Millions and millions of dollars worth of pest control. But the interesting thing about this photo of a ladybird beetle is this is a species at risk. This is the nine spotted ladybird beetle. It's a native but its numbers have declined greatly, probably not because of climate change or probably not because of pesticide, but possibly because of competition with ladybird beetles that were, which is also the name for ladybugs that were brought in from Europe or even from Asia. Um, here's one that you can look for uh, that's a native species. It's called the parenthesis ladybird. I always thought it should be called the dog-faced ladybird because that's what it looks like to me. But nonetheless, you notice it has a little W on there and sometimes you're told watch for the W because that's the bad one. No, not necessarily. Uh, there's there's a mix of species out there and if you if you get a book like John Acorn's book of uh, Ladybirds of Alberta or some other book, uh, you can really uh, pick them out instantly in a short period of time of watching. Okay, a couple more things here. Gardening. And, and, and in crops as well. These small parasitoid hymenoptera, like this little black wasp, attack aphids. And so here's a picture of one uh, zooming in on a, uh, some aphids. And in the next photo, again, of the nine spotted ladybird beetle, um, which uh, Canadian Wildlife Service and uh, environment uh, uh, agencies, federal and provincial, are, are monitoring and caring about. Good for them, that's fantastic. But also in this photo, are little aphid mummies. You can see it looks like uh, some uh, winter long johns with a trap door at the back there. That's an actually dead aphid mummy that instead of producing an adult aphid, opened up one day and produced another wasp. And that is actually being harnessed. I just thought I'd mention an example case. Okay, this is cabbage seed pod weevil that's been here since the early 90s and it's a big pest and it and other pests like ligus, bugger and so on have natural enemies. And uh, uh, Hector and Tipa here, who I mentioned, uh, have this big project with a big team across Canada to look at natural enemies and how they're affected by things like landscape. Here's another one that you might not know about, uh, a lacewing killing aphids in your yard for you, the adult. Um, this looks quite different. Uh, a damsel bug provides uh, free pest control, basically, in un relatively unsprayed uh, uh, crops uh, around our area. Here's uh, my favorite beetle in Alberta, big black beetle called Passamachus elongatus. And if I'm correct, I think so. Passamachus means all fight. And it is too. Uh, this one is uh, uh, one of the members of this uh, Alberta Conservation Association project we have down in southern Alberta out on the prairie where they're establishing ecosystems, uh, semi-native, semi-natural ecosystems that are slowly building uh, where it was previously cultivated. I'll just mention a few spiders. I hope uh, nobody minds looking at this spider. The spider is actually quite beautiful, big eyes, um, nice color, but it's also a pest control agent. Here it is killing a, a, a plant bug. And everybody's favorite, unfortunately not so, but the uh, black widow spider, oh, we've got one in the east and we've got one in the west, Latrodectus hesperus. And then there's one in the southern US and confusing them perhaps makes this one seem a little more dangerous than it really is. Oh, you can see the eye shine in this picture. Yeah, uh, spider eyes actually shine back like a cat or a dog or a wolf at night. Here's one that's a real hero. This is a running crab spider that's killing a ligus bug for a farmer apparently, uh, even though it's palpy and its legs are all torn off. It's missing a lot of body parts, but it's still running around just being a predator. And often in the next one here, um, spiders prey are other spiders. So it's a very complex food web. And I should mention too, that sometimes they're blamed uh, for things that really are not based in reality. This next one is a grass a uh, spider, it's also called funnel weaver. It's, it's a really common in, in uh, southern Alberta. And a wolf spider, those are sometimes confused with, oddly enough, um, the brown recluse. So everyone's heard of someone who's been bitten by a brown recluse, but I, I guarantee you it's probably bacteria or a thorn or something like that because this map shows the distribution of the brown recluse. 
if one ever shows up in Alberta, I have a standing $100 reward for that spider. I would like to have that spider. So uh, anyway, it's, it's sometimes blamed. Okay, here's another example uh, for why we should care about uh, species diversity and maintaining it. This is a tomato potato salad. Um, we started monitoring in 2013 and found it in, uh, in Alberta and uh, in other places as well. And it carries a disease, it can affect potatoes, so it's important to know about it. But here's the interesting thing about it. When they're young, they come out from that little tiny orange leg, egg, sorry, they come out from that, that orange egg, form a little uh, immature stage that grows into older stages and then forms the uh, adult above there with its yellow legs and its yellow body before it hardens. At all those stages, ladybird beetles will eat them by the hundreds and damsel bugs and spiders and rove beetles and many, many other things that build up in potato fields because they're not using a lot of insecticide lately. Uh, Colorado potato beetle hasn't been as big a problem as it has previously and also in some other areas, but because of the reduced insecticide, there is a jungle of natural enemies in some of these crops. And when these invaders do come, they might be controlled. And one more spider photo. Uh, eating a grasshopper, you might think that's good, but in that case, it's a grasshopper that's no harm. And in fact, on the next one, this spotted green grasshopper has the unfortunate uh, similar appearance to um, some crop pests, but this one feeds on Russian thistle and kochia. Uh, I'll mention one last thing here. Uh, flies attack grasshoppers. You can see maggots on this grasshopper. All of these pupae came out. Uh, this is a hard life for insects here. Uh, in the next photo, there's a famous butterfly, the painted lady, uh, which you might recognize more from above. Well, when I when I uh, find the caterpillars on thistle, I bring them home, and this is sometimes what comes out of them, fly pupae. And here's the fly that was living inside of that caterpillar, so it's a hard life for them. So I'll just talk a little bit about invasive species. Uh, there are many invasive species, and some of them are invertebrates. Um, and you can find a list online, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, very famous. Here's a map we made of 50 years of weather data, and this was only up to 2005, so now it's much more advanced, showing that things are getting a little warmer up here in a little longer season, and maybe that invites them in. Some of our existing issues, like ticks and pathogens, could be at, at an advantage from that. Here's an example of an insect that just arrived, and we don't know if it's going to do anything or not, if it's a plus or a minus. Very strange. For many, many years, we did not have tortoise beetle. Suddenly, we have tortoise beetle. There's a, a yellow one, a gold one, and one that actually is red and looks just like the seven-spotted ladybug. There's a seven-spotted ladybug. There's a tortoise beetle that looks like it. It confers some ability to survive or avoid predation because the, uh, the predators know that ladybugs taste really bad. I mentioned a minute ago this um, uh, the invaders. Okay, so we have Asian ladybugs that were brought in in maybe 1910, 1920. We have European ones brought in in the 1980s, and they've spread across North America. Um, and they've always been a problem. I mean, these this is these are some posters I grabbed from a, a Norwegian insect news. That means insect news in Norwegian there at the top. Uh, the cover, I really like these uh, alien species wanted dead, apparently. Uh, and that's the one that was just shown. Uh, um. And uh, you can see from the flags painted on these Colorado potato beetles that, you know, in certain countries that are receiving them from other countries, they're not very excited about that. Uh, and so there's a lot of international ruckus over that. This emerald uh, uh, looking insect is the green immigrant leaf weevil. And weevils have scales. I'm not sure. I, I could have zoomed in, I guess, with a microscope, but they actually have scales. And this one are bright green. So just a couple more insects, and then I'll move on. Uh, everybody knows that we have some native species that are annoying. This is a horse fly at the top, deer fly. Uh, um, you know, they 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 have veterinarian problems and veterinary problems and so on. I mean, these are significant pests in many, many areas. However, some of them have unusual life cycles. Here's a fly that is a pollinator as an adult. 
and actually quite attractive. And unfortunately, most people think it's a bee, but bees have four wings. Uh, it has a charming uh, name for the immature stage. stage. It's called the rat-tailed maggot. And the rat-tailed maggot is important, as are hundreds of other species, in decomposing wood and uh, leaves and muck. Here's one example of a species that declined and came back. So for about 10 or 20 years, we had a hard time even finding this species. And it's not just because it looks like it's food plant. It's actually adapted to its food plant so well. There's another picture of it that it is silver like silver sage. Uh, but it is coming back and I think it has to do greatly with the weather and whether or not that affects the food plant in a positive way. OK, this uh, I've got a couple of images here. I'll just show you if you wanted to look up anything about insect decline. This is a famous study in Germany with long term declines of butterflies. Uh, this is a paper in which uh, a number of scientists, including my friend Jeff Harvey in the Netherlands, uh, is trying to put together a roadmap for uh, what to do about this. So here's their roadmap. They call for immediate action that has no regret. We, you do these things and the world is better. So let's just do it. Secondly, uh, we could move on to uh, the next stage, which could be midterm action, research, long-term databases, and so on. And finally, partnerships among uh, not only citizen scientists, but also agencies would be very important. OK, one last paper, Interpreting Insect Decline, Seven Challenges. You can find review after review on this topic, uh, but this is what I would like to emphasize as my last point. Number five there, and this is my list. Everyone else has their own list, but this is my list. Number five to me is the most important one. If we can get the public interested in insects and spiders so that they take up insect identification and watching and just being aware of what's in the ecosystem, that is valuable data. That is not trivial at all. It's quite important. So the more networks we have that involve people, um, looking and and identifying and using iNaturalist or using photo guides, the better. Uh, and that's all. This is to remind me it's my last slide. That's me. Wear your mask. Excellent. Thank you so much for that very wonderful presentation and the, the really fabulous photos. Really fantastic. Um, Thank I'll you. start right away with uh, the questions here. We have a question from Leona Jacobs. You harvest your milkweed seeds from repropagation, and then in brackets, so it's native to the area. While planting milkweed is great, is there a danger in planting the non-local species? If people want to buy milkweed seeds to plant around their gardens, what is the native species to look? What are, is the native species to look for? So we are not introducing non-native to the local area milkweed yeah that is a good point and i think i well you know i look for showy milkweed and i see it all around and i grab the seeds and i'm i'm used to it now and i wouldn't take some from somebody's garden or something like that so when i take it from a roadside or a pasture i'm i'm sure i look at the flower the flower is unique really unique it's beautiful actually but i uh I know what I'm picking and I have never ordered in any, but the Native Plant Council would be a good uh, uh, group of people to answer that question about whether or not they could possibly be invasive. But the the uh, the good part is the showy milkweed, which is the one we have growing just wild here, is their food plant and uh, the others might be. Um, so I just use that. Lovely. Um... Next one. I've got a little extra seed. Yeah, I've got a little extra seed. Maybe I'll try to make some available. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. I'll find out. Um, our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. Some populations in the world harvest insects for food. In the industrial world, there's a movement to grow and harvest insects as protein, food supply, and pet food. Comments, please. 
Well, I think it's a good idea. In fact, uh, when I went to the uh, Entomological Society of Canada, Entomological Society of America meeting in Vancouver a couple of years ago, I came back loaded with bags of dried crickets to feed to my students and at, at break in class, and everybody loved them. Uh, cricket protein, beetle grubs, all kinds of things of that nature. I think you're absolutely right. It's it's in the future in our food supply, not just for pets, but for, for people. It's... Uh, and of course, Alberta has a big cricket facility now, and things are expanding. And uh, um, a lot of that's for pets, but it's moving into human food supply. I think it's a good idea, as long as we have some regulations and monitoring to make sure it's uh, uh, high standard, high quality, like any anything in our in our food uh, chain. Um, our next question comes from Trevor Page. As of food systems evolve, urban vertical farms are increasing. Will insects remain an important part of our ag agriculture in this environment? What issues do you foresee? I think one of the biggest problems is knowing what we have, right? I mean, uh, it might have been Leopold who first said it, uh, the first uh, um, law of tinkering is save all the parts, right? So if we are aware of what's in an ecosystem and we know kind of what impacts are being caused by our different management actions, we can have what's called adaptive management. You know, there was a, one of my profs when I was in school was this world genius on systems modeling, Buzz Holling, and he pushed adaptive management, adaptive management. Every step you take, you keep the notes and, and get the data and, and adapt. That's what we can do with agriculture. Now, we might have big pest problems coming up as we slowly change or deregister pest control products. So it's possible um, natural enemies might help to save us. It's possible that uh, natural products and other solutions coming along, but uh, uh, it won't be easy. But I think that the only thing we know for sure is that it's gonna be easier with more information, not less. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Killer bees have been in the news lately. What are they and should we be paying closer attention to them? Uh, killer bees and murder hornets, right? Uh, it's all been in the news. And uh, I think that, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, ha needs some attention, but only if it becomes common and you know it starts to spread and people are watching and every once in a while I notice that they they find one and take care of it um the mur so-called murder hornets not a very nice name is it um uh I don't know the latest but I know one was you know BC Washington Oregon they're very sensitive about this and watching for it but I do think we have uh, if we had a, a sort of a, a philosophy of looking wider, maybe we would anticipate these problems a little sooner. It's just like our current pandemic, right? If we were paying more attention uh, to the diversity that's out there, we might be able to anticipate the next problem in advance. But I would say this is not a big problem for us in Alberta right now. That's, that's certainly true. Uh, but it's an interesting one. So it's on someone's radar. Our next question comes from um, um, somebody who's using the name Bee Speaker. I'm interested in how much systematic pesticides like neonics are being used in agriculture in Southern Alberta right now. Uh, there are there are crops that use it certainly, and uh, there are um, uh, there have been reductions in that in recent years. Um, We've had neonicotinoid insecticides used for decades, of course, uh, and of all the current concerns and so on, that is that is being reduced. But I just want to point out that those aren't the only pesticides that are bad for uh, bees, and they're not always bad for bees. So I think we need to nuance the data a little more precisely and make sure we, we know exactly what we're talking about and what's happening, because some other products, even some that aren't insecticides, could infect, uh, could affect the, uh, sorry, could could affect the uh, pollinators. And uh, uh, so the, these products are used, and they're used in all kinds of different crops, even in flowers, right? But um, you can find the latest regulations in, in any 
provincial agriculture government website, I think that's the way to do it because they keep those up up to date rather than go to primary scientists or academics. Um, yeah, it's not an easy problem. And as you know, France and certain other nations have really restricted their use. Uh, changes are coming. Uh, and there are other systemics as well and other sprays um, and natural control methods as well. And the impacts are all carefully tested each time, but sometimes there are interactions and cumulative effects that we haven't anticipated. So the, the work of those regulators that that release those things onto the market uh, only when they're deemed safe is not only extremely important, but it's not just a one shot thing. There has to be post registration monitoring and continued research and working with farmers, working with citizens. Um, I'm not really in that field anymore now that I've gone to a university, but I uh, used to be and it's uh, it's changing every day. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. What is the periodicity of our northern cicada and when do we next expect emergence? Well, we have uh, we have three species that don't have the same kind of periodicity that they have in the US broods. We don't have a 17 year. Uh, we have one that's out every year in southern Alberta, uh, nearly every year. Uh, they, they tend to have cycles um, I, I could name species, but it's better just to go to the Strickland Museum at the University of Alberta and look them up. There's Ramosa and there's, a, there's several that you can see right there and learn to recognize them for others in the audience. I know Mark probably does know them, but, but uh, they tend to have uh, kind of surges, uh, some of these, instead of a sudden periodicity, like after 17 years they come out, they tend to be... Uh, low, then high, then low for a year, and then gone for a while, and then back again. So it's a, it's a different kind of a cycle. And of course, the, uh, the interesting evolutionary story with regard to cicadas is that many of them have a prime number, uh, which supposedly has an evolutionary advantage because predators can't hit on 7, 11, and so on, 17, as easily as they can hit on every other year or every fourth year. So I would say watch for them. And if anyone in the audience in Alberta and Saskatchewan sees that walking cicada, that grass cicada, I'd like to know about it because I've been keeping track. And there are some years in which it's totally gone for three or four years, five years, and then it's back. Wow, prime numbers, right? Um, Beth Mandel, um, she's responding to the whole question around, there's a little bit of a discussion going on on the milkweed. Um, somebody said that somebody, G Leona J Jacob asked the question about the milkweed. Somebody responded, Show we milkweed? I think you responded to that as well in the question. So Beth Mandel is just responding, I look online, Show we milkweed? This is the preferred milkweed species if you want to grow a native one, as it's non invasive. So that's more a comment on her part. Yeah, could I make it, yeah. make a comment? Uh, interesting history here, right? It used to be on the list of uh, noxious weeds, uh, and then it, for a while, it, you know, it, actually in the '80s when monarchs actually were showing up here fairly often compared to now. I was trying to argue that maybe it shouldn't be on the weed list, but I'm not a weed scientist, so why should anyone listen to me, really? Um, and I think eventually people began to realize that certain of our weeds are maybe less of a problem than others and slowly it came off the list and so that's why we're we're able to grow it and i actually think that we need to investigate this here at the northern range i mean they go all the way up to edmonton so it's not it's not like lethbridge is the most northern however um in the usa they have a big program with golf courses and they can become special green golf courses if they grow milkweed for monarch butterfly i think it's a fantastic idea and uh, I think that uh, if, if gardens and parks and so on grew it here, it doesn't really get out of control. Uh, they grow rather slowly uh, and they're easy to kill. So I don't think it's a, such a serious weed, but I, I'm, I'm all for seeing more of it. Some of my students actually are putting together a little program to uh, entice uh, towns and so on to grow more. I'll push the university to do it and the high schools could do it too. You know, the high schools could grow it in their flower beds. Yeah. Um, 
And then Bev's, Bev Mundell again. Thanks, Dan. What's happening with our local bee species? Are they in decline? Could you speak about other pollinators in our area? Yeah, now that, that's a problem because uh, uh, among all the wild bees, bumblebees included, um, there are so many differences in how they're increasing or decreasing or changing uh, that uh, you have to be an expert to talk to this question, to speak to that question. So I can't even answer. I mean, I know that some across Canada are um, at risk. And I know that some years uh, native bees of different types are higher or lower, but uh, even an expert in another kind of insect can't um, can't really just opine on uh, what's wrong with them. I think it has to be a bee expert. So I'm gonna I would leave that up to the uh, to the to the bee uh, experts. So that's that's one I I feel that I have to see. I can't answer. <laughs> There's a million species of insects in Canada. So it's a very big topic, yeah, nearly a million. Yeah, we'll have to have you back once a month for a whole year to cover them all. Well, work your, work your way through all the other uh, biodiversity experts. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question comes from Le Leona Jacobs. What are your thoughts on gardeners buying insects and then in brackets, i.e. ladybirds, beetles, uh, commercially for from other places to boost the local population of insects. For example, ladybird beetles to fight aphids. Yeah, I, um, I used to feel ambivalent about that. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't now, I think it's fine. What I used to, what I used to hate hearing about are the, I used to hate uh, hearing about the weddings where people bought butterflies from somewhere else and released them at a wedding. That's a bad idea. I don't think too many people do that anymore. But um, I think that if a person wants to bring in uh, ladybird beetles or mites or whatever and release those and try to get some natural controls, it's a good experience. It's educational. It might even have local impact, but I don't think it's really going to affect the overall populations of our species. Uh, we monitored for years uh, in potato fields, but in some other spots as well, the ladybird beetles, and we had about 15 native species plus one introduced species that would increase and decrease by the millions, by the millions for unknown reasons. And they're really affected by uh, parasites, they're affected by diseases, they're affected by weather, particularly weather. So if we augment their numbers, I think it will just dissipate. You know, it's just like smoke on the wind. It's, uh, it's, it's not a bad idea because then people are aware of them, which is great because then maybe they won't sweep them up and put them into the garbage bag in the spring. But uh, whether or not that actually has that impact, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, with some other introductions, it has a huge impact because they spread. In this case, the species are already present. So it only adds a little bit and uh, and they do fly out. I mean, you know, they're in my yard. They're not in my yard. One year they are, one year they aren't. And I know what's happening, of course. Uh, the whole population is covering 100 kilometers around and they they move and they, they and so on. Um, so what I do, I suppose it contributes or affects the greater population, but uh, not very much. The next question comes from Knut. Um, related to Trevor's question, um, his question was regarding, uh, let me just go back a little bit, um, the, food, the urban vertical farming. Um, so related to questions, to Trevor's question, greenhouses will arguably, arguably be productive now, let me start again. Sorry about that. Greenhouses will arguably be producing a large portion of our vegetables in the future. Are insects a necessary part of that production? Uh, well, one of the biggest problems, of course, in greenhouses is pest control, and it has to be done in a, in a precise scientific way. Decades ago, uh, this was a big research topic in the Netherlands and places like that that were on the forefront of, of greenhouse and glasshouse use and in, in Britain. 
and then eventually in the US and Canada, and now the whole world is using greenhouses. Uh, I went to the World uh, Orthoptera, which is grasshopper and locust meeting in Morocco in uh, 2019, and flying in, looking down, I couldn't believe my eyes, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of greenhouses. So even in a beautiful climate like Morocco, they go with greenhouses. So obviously Alberta has more and more, that's true. But I would say the biggest issue is pest control. Uh, now, of course, there'll be specialty crops that maybe need some insects as well as beneficials and as pest control agents. But it's a, it's a very uh, complex and well-researched topic and will continue to be as the value grows up. I think it's a good thing. I think anyone um, um, investigating the future of greenhouses should take pest control in, into consideration. Okay, our next question comes from Hector. I joined a little late. Maybe you already talked about hoppers. What may happen with grasshopper pests this summer? Is the risk of pest damage high? I think you mentioned this before, but Hector came in late. Yeah, yeah well, the, the, uh, although I, for, for decades, I did the grasshopper uh, survey uh, training and did the forecast with the data from uh, those field personnel. Uh, I don't do it now, of course, and uh, the Alberta government, the um, Saskatchewan government and so on, puts out the map. So I'd say, look at that map and interpret it as follows. Uh, you'd see where on that map, you have a high breeding density the previous year. If you don't have any potential, then you can't have a problem the following spring. But if you do have potential, then you have to watch the weather, of course. Now, the problem with grasshoppers in our area is the species species are slowly shifting. Um, we have some species which used to be rare and are now common in large numbers. I, if, I, if I was just doing a grasshopper talk, I would have shown the photos of hundreds per square meter that I saw in Peace River. Uh, two summers ago, um, and we knew they were coming. For 15, 20 years, we knew that one was on the way up. In fact, it hit Kamloops first, but it took its time. And so I think some of these things can be predicted. Other things, it's almost impossible. It's really difficult. Uh, it's because they can, they change on a, uh, they turn on a dime, you might say, because for example, if you have a coming outbreak and everybody's ready and then it snows on them, the day they hatch and kills off the first half of the population, that changes everything. However, it is possible to predict. Uh, and in fact, a, a model for predicting development and calculating, doing those calculations for how quickly they grow was developed here in Lethbridge long ago. And it's uh, it's been used in hundreds and hundreds of studies with other insects. So we can more precisely predict what they will do when they arrive, but we can't predict years in advance, uh, it's really difficult. Now this year, if you look at the map, you'll see that there's a couple of strange cases where there is a, a moderate increase in some of Southern Alberta. And there's a big unknown factor up in the Peace River where every other year they seem to have a problem. So that means that the forecast is exactly wrong all the time because if it's high, then they predict high and it's low and it's low, they predict low, but it goes to high. So this is a, this is a sticky problem. And I think that uh, we can't be too complacent about these things and assume that we know how to forecast them necessarily in the same way for all species. So what we need is a species specific approach. Right now, the clear wing grasshopper is increasing again. And yet I found that species to be about one third infected with parasites last year. And I was only looking out of curiosity. Whereas the one in the north was 0%. And it could be because of this every other year it escapes parasitism. So there's a little bit of complicated ecology that has to go into these questions. Um, if I was, if I were farming, I would just talk to the lo local ag reps and see what the counts looked like last year on those sites. Because if they're not laying eggs then you won't have any the following spring. But if they are, then you may or may not. Okay. Not, not very satisfying answer. It's a difficult uh, group of insects because it's not just one species, it's many. 
Our next question comes from the Bridge City News. Um, they also joined in a bit late and apologize for that, but they asked the question, the bio or your bio, our flyer on their bio, um, mentioned that insects and spiders are facing a sharp decline. How can we make sure that we conserve them, especially lady beetles? Sure. Now, not all, here's the problem. Not all of the insects and spiders are in decline, so we need to pick out which are and which aren't. Then we need to distinguish about whether or not it's a trend or just a short-term blip, right? I mean, we, we don't want to, um, we don't want to be crying chicken little because uh, a species declined two years in a row because quite easily it could just be regression to the mean and it goes back to the central level again. So we need long-term data. That's the problem. We need long-term data and often we do not. Now with ladybird beetles, um, we've got multiple species. We have unknown peaks and troughs in their populations. For example, 2015 was just a red letter ladybird year. Why? I have no idea. We counted so many and found so many, and yet the following year they were down. Why? Um, it has to do with, I think, uh, the schedule of the weather they encounter. Like, do they get enough heat at the right time? Do they get uh, too many cold, wet days at the wrong time? If we could put that together a bit, and it wouldn't wouldn't be too difficult. It would just take some study. I think we could uh, monitor the ladybird beetles and know a little bit more about them. But the problem is uh, a lot of people don't even realize that there's more than one species or two species, right? There's there's so many. Uh, I don't know how many we have. I think we have 60, but I typically find 15 or 20 in a summer. Um, so it really is a problem that we don't have the information. And it would be fantastic to have citizen science networks that would report on whether they saw the two spotted or the seven spotted or the nine spotted or the parenthesis, the convergent, right? Uh, but to do that, you have to use the photo guides and we have to get on the internet, which by the way, the internet, everyone has a lot of bad things to say about social media and the internet, but it is an absolutely fantastic tool for what we're talking about people becoming educated about recognizing species, social media and the internet are perfect for this. So uh, I'm an optimist. I think it's getting better and better. So. I think that's in the same way we have the bird count, we could have an insect, right? That yearly bird count. Right, but the pro, the, yeah, that's true. However, uh, there's so many insects, right? I mean, um, it, it just boggles the mind. Uh, I, I think all the birds of the world, if I'm not mistaken, I should look this up before I start talking, but if I'm not mistaken, there's about the same number of species of ants as it are all the birds of, in the world. The ants are in one taxonomic family. The birds are in more than 150. Wow. So if you expand that to uh, all the insects and all the spiders, it's a big job. However, we can pick out particular things that people notice are happening with certain species, invading, for example, uh, or, or, or disappearing, and, uh, and advertise it and collect some data. I, you know, we don't want to jump to conclusions too quickly. And that's why I say uh, clearly not all insects are in decline. But if we have some that are important to us and they decline, we should find out about it. For one thing, it could affect wildlife, right? With the food supply. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Regarding the controversy regarding open pit mining on the eastern slopes, are you aware of any studies of the effect of selenium on aquatic invertebrates? Uh, that's a good question. I have looked into it a little bit, but I, I don't know enough to speak about it, but there are other factors as well that would affect those aquatic insects that could be related to activities like mining, right? Like for example, uh, uh, minerals, other minerals in the water, pH, um, turbidity, uh, silt, and temperature. Uh, Rob Sonnenberg uh, did a master's uh, years ago on, uh, not so many years ago, on uh, open pit mining uh, up near Hinton and found that 
perhaps as important or maybe even more important than the pollutant content, potential pollutant content, is just the lack of uh, nutrients and the change in temperature. So it's a whole system, I think, and it needs some needs some study before we start uh, pointing fingers at things that we just happen to know cause problems elsewhere. Bob Mundell, is information lacking due to low government funding for insect studies? Yeah, that's uh, that's hard to say. I mean, uh, although I sometimes seek funding to hire students or do something like that, I'm not an expert in those sorts of things. And I've, I've, I've worked a little bit for NGOs and so on, but I'm still not an expert in that topic. But um, I think part of it is just a natural direction of funding towards the biggest problems. Um, and perhaps there are bigger problems that deserve the money, or perhaps we haven't made the case that uh, these are important things. We don't want to lose some things and we don't want to gain others. So if we know uh, where we're at, um, I think funding can be directed towards those things well worth doing. And with citizen science networks, we can do more with less. Um. Which is actually a great gateway into Jim Miller's question. Have you considered using worm watch model for citizen science for insects, i.e. insect watch? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, there's worm watch, lady, uh, you know, the ladybug uh, network, uh, mainly in the USA, but also here. And there's frog watch, right, and so on. We actually had a grasshopper watch network that was so long ago that people were using dial-up um, dial modems and letters, writing, writing letters. So that's one reason it didn't work out so well, but we actually had um, schools involved, right? We had Picture Butte and other schools involved where we, we gave talks and got children interested and so on, but we didn't have the communication links that we have now. So we could, we could easily, um, design new systems. And by the way, of course, uh, apps. We made a Windows app. I'm sorry, we made a uh, iPhone app uh, seven or eight years ago, I guess, for identifying some of these insects. Now it's so much better. That's the problem, it's better and better every year. But I think with, uh, with identification apps and with uh, social media and with uh, networks, perhaps linked to the scientific societies, uh, the scientific societies are sitting there as the obvious um, useful organizer for some of these things. I think we could make great headway. Excellent. That's all the... Oh, one just came in from Cheryl. Uh, is there an insect or, or group of insects that is slash are particularly important for maintenance of the coolie ecosystem? Of the coolies, yeah. Uh, well, I guess if I had to quickly choose, uh, I would say um, I'd I'd first be concerned about two main groups. One is um, pollinators of native plants, and the other one would be uh, food supply for the birds. And uh, I mean, there are other things that are important, you know, spiders and ground dwelling beetles and so on. And, and plant bugs that might be food for something else. Um, it's great diversity, but I, but I think, yeah, pollinators, if I was gonna organize a survey of the Cooley ecosystem arthropod um, section of the ecosystem, I think I would look at pollinators and food supply for birds. Those are both very important. However, there's so many other things to do. Even the columbola and the things like that that live down in the soil that that drive the nutrient turnover and decomposition are extremely important. Uh, and of course, invading forest and, uh, and uh, urban tree pests, big problem area. Um, no shortage of topics. Okay, and that was it for our questions today. Um, before we end the live stream, do you have a take home message for our viewers? Uh, well, Yes, I guess I do. Well, one would be to set aside some time to actually look at the framework of biodiversity 
and how they're organized taxonomically, ecologically, what's important, what's in your area. Instead of just jumping in and, and trying to learn a few off the top, it is actually good to look at the whole framework of uh, what's in the area and how they're related taxonomically. Learn about even their evolution and their fossils, but learn about you know where they came from or how long they've been here. Learn about glacial history. Learn about uh, plant ecology. So all these background topics are well worth establishing your understanding of nature before you start learning to recognize individual species. Uh, people who do that aren't fooled by some of the mistakes we make, you know, like this whole brown recluse problem I happened to mention. Um, if, when you realize that, uh, you know, Canada has how many species of spiders, spiders and mites together, it's 11,000, I think. Uh, and then in the USA, you've got layers and layers, latitudinal layers and layers of, of a stopping point for certain species that just don't make it. Why? It's because they have ecology and biogeography that relates to the map. So I think uh, iNaturalist is a good place to start. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Jim Miller, thanks, Dan, for a great and informative talk. Knut, many thanks, Dan. Um, there's some other thank yous earlier up. In the, in the thread. And on behalf of SACPA, thank you very much for your time and for your very informative talk. Um, we hope that everybody who's tuned in today will join us again next week for uh, the topic Private Healthcare for Alberta, Efficiency, Effectiveness and Equity by Dr. Christopher McNabb. And thank you very much and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.